G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Own Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Daniel. I pray that it will be a benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So welcome to this session of the Book of Daniel. We're looking at now, this is the sixth session. We're going to cover today from chapter 3, verse 19, down to chapter 4, verse 18. Now, just a quick recap of the last session. We saw the erection of this image, an image of gold. Uh, remember, Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold in this image. Uh, but an act of, but in, in an act of defiance now, he, he made the entire statue of gold. What he was saying was, listen, Babylon's going to last forever. So he called all the rulers in his province and all the lesser officials to come to the dedication of the image which he had set up. And this includes the three friends of Daniel. Daniel apparently wasn't around at this time. So when they all get there, it turns out to be a worship service to the image. They're all called to fall down at the sound of the the playing of the music, but Daniel's three friends, uh, they're not going to worship the golden image. Nah. And what's the penalty for their failure? Well, it's to be cast into the fiery furnace. So what what, what would happen here is that the, these three Jews, I mean, when everybody falls down, there's the three men still standing there. Can't miss them. So these three Jews were accused of not falling down. They failed to worship this image of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and they do not worship the golden image you've set up. Why? Because this is, this is they're, they're acting in disobedience to this decree. King Nebuchadnezzar is now filled with rage and he gives them a second chance, but again, they're not going to bow down. And their faith is demonstrated in their trust in their God, the God of Israel. And he will, what they say is that he will deliver them if he chooses, but if not, so be it. And so they recognize that it may not be God's will to save them but they're still prepared to go ahead and, and not bow down to this image. So what we see here is that serving the true God is not conditional on him saving them. We will not serve your gods, they say. We will not worship the golden image you have set up. And so these men demonstrate that they're full of faith in the God of Israel. Now, what's going to happen to them? We're going to see in verse uh, um, uh, here, uh, continuing on from verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury in the form of his visage, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnaces seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded certain mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Verse 21. Then these men were bound in their hosen, their tunics and their mantles and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So what we see here is that in spite of the very high regard with which Nebuchadnezzar held these three men, which we see from right back in, in chapter 1, verse 20, he determined to demonstrate his authority by ordering their immediate execution. And this would serve as a lesson to any others who might consider rebelling against his political and religious authority. We don't have a bar of this. And in verse 19, we read of the effect their response had on Nebuchadnezzar. He was full of fury. He was madly angry, madly angry. But now even more so, we're told that the form of his visage was changed. His rage totally distorted his features. And at this point, he was completely, he was a completely different man. And once again, illogical reasoning takes over as he commanded that they should heat the furnaces seven times more than usual. Now, this was totally unnecessary because it was sufficiently hot to kill anyone. Why make it seven times hotter? This would actually decrease the torment they'd have to suffer rather than increase it. So he's not thinking clearly. And also, it would tend to kill these three Jewish men quicker rather than slower. So the king is no longer thinking straight. So he now orders the heat to be increased sevenfold. And then in verse 20, he issues the command for their execution. And he commanded certain mighty men that were in his army. So these would have been uh, chief military officers who were to carry at this execution. 
So three friends were three friends were now bound up, tied up. Why this is necessary, it doesn't say. Uh, again, he's not thinking logically. But after they were bound in their own clothing, they were now to be cast into the fire, into the furnace. And then we see in verse 21, the command is obeyed. First, they're bound in the clothes that they were wearing. The clothing listed here were tunics or, or, or turbans, hosen and mantles. This was all expensive clothing because remember, it was a kind of clothing that was befitting their particular high office. Because remember, they were rulers of the province of Babylon. So all three men had come dressed in their stately garb for the, for the dedication, right? But they could not go so far as to worship the image. And the fact that Nebuchadnezzar now uh, does not press further to have this expensive clothing removed shows how angry he is and how quickly he wants to see them dead. So because the king's command was urgent, this expensive clothing is not to be spared. At the end of the verse, it was all cast into the furnace with the three men. In verse 22, therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men. Which men? It was the ones who the ones who die as a result of the furnace being heated seven times hotter than normal were the military personnel, his, his, his mighty men, who were responsible for throwing the three men into the furnace. So they get killed. So because of the king's order that the furnace heat be increased, and because he wanted their execution carried out immediately, they could not allow the heat to die down first. So the soldiers did succeed in getting into the top opening of the furnace to drop them into it. However, because of the intense heat, flames shot out of the top of the furnace and simply consumed these three other men. And at this point, the whole scene is now about to change. Verse 23 now describes the three Jews in the furnace. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Notice here that the verse repeats that the captives were bound. What's that doing? Well, it's simply highlighting to us that they could do nothing to help themselves. Like, like their hands were tied, couldn't do a thing. So there's a real paradox here because those outside the furnace died and those inside the furnace are still living. Now, just a, a bit of an aside here. At this point, the Septuagint, which is the you know the, 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 the translation of, of the Hebrew scriptures, they insert in, it inserts the apocryphal uh, prayer of Azariah in the furnace. That's one of the books, and the song of the three holy children. Uh, so the, the Septuagint waxed it in uh, this this uh, thing in here, the apocryphal these two apocryphal books in here, and the prayer of Azariah um, consists of twenty two verses in which. God is praised and Israel's enemies are punished. And then comes five verses that describe the special heating of the furnace and the descent of the angel of the Lord who extinguished the fire. And this is followed by the song of the three holy children comprising 40 verses. It, well, it's a hymn of thanksgiving for the deliverance issued by the angel of the Lord. And, and both of these texts were later included in the Latin Vulgate. And as a result, they are now regarded by the Roman Catholic Church as part of the biblical canon. But as you can see, it's not in our Bibles. It's in the Latin Vulgate. And it's part of what they see as being part of the canon. But nobody else does. Hmm. Now, we see the deliverance in verses 24 to 27. <clears throat> then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the aspect of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the, to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. He spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the satraps, the deputies, and the governors, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men 
that the fire had no power upon their bodies, nor was the hair of their head singed, neither were their hosen changed, nor had the smell of fire passed on them. So in verses 24 to 25, what we do, what we see here is that we read that Nebuchadnezzar himself sees a miracle. In verse 24, he looks into the bottom opening of the furnace and his mood suddenly changes from anger to astonishment and he raises a question. Did not we cast three men in? And he gets verification of that fact from his counselors. They answered and said unto the king, true, O king, we only cast three men in. Now, and in verse 25, he now makes five observations. First of all, he says, lo, I see four men loose. So he sees four men, not three men in the fire. And second, <clears throat> he sees Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are no longer bound. And apparently what happened was the fire succeeded in burning off their bonds, but it burned nothing else. So the fire is used for their benefit and not for their hurt. And third, he notices that they're walking around in the midst of the fire. It's like we're having a bit of a chat. They're not lying injured, which would normally be the case after having fallen from the top of the furnace down to the bottom. They're not standing still. Neither are they scampering around trying to run out of the opening to escape the fire. Rather, they're walking around in the midst of the fire as if nothing's going on. His fourth observation is they have no hurt. The Aramaic says originally, harm is not upon them. No harm had come to them whatsoever. They're not burning. They're not injured. They're not roasting. And his fifth observation concerns a fourth person who had not been thrown into the fire. He sees that the aspect of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, the King James Version says, like a son of God with an uppercase G. But the Aramaic here does not read a son of God in reference to Christ, but rather a son of the gods. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar would have known nothing about such a biblical concept as a son of the Most High God. Certainly in Nebuchadnezzar's theology, there were these sons of gods, because their gods, according to them, would intermarry amongst themselves and also with humans, and they would produce Various children who would be half human, half God, and therefore superhuman. So what Nebuchadnezzar is saying is that this fourth person looks like someone who is a superhuman. He's the son of the gods. And in verse 28, we're going to see it is not going to be Christ, but rather it is going to be an angel. Nothing Nebuchadnezzar says here goes contrary to his own Babylonian theology. Rather, it is in keeping with Babylonian theology. And in verse 26, he goes as close to the opening as he dares because he has seen what the heat did to his soldiers and he calls for the men to come out. And notice it was only at his command that they did come out. Until then, they just remained in the furnace. And then in verse 27, the three men are now examined by Nebuchadnezzar himself and the officials of the Babylonian Empire, and the satraps, the deputies, and the governors, and the king's councillors, being together, saw these men. What did they see? Well, they noted four things pretty quickly. First, the fire had no power upon their bodies. They were not any more tanned. They weren't tanned in any way. They weren't burnt in any way. Second, nor was the hair of their head singed. Third, Neither were their hose and chains, that's their clothes. None of their clothing was changed in any way. It was still the beautiful official garb that they went in with. Fourth, nor had the smell of fire passed on them. Not even the smell of smoke was upon them. So the fire had no effect in the bodies of Hananiah, Mishael, and Shadrach, uh, Mishael and Azariah. The hair of the three men had not been singed. The garments did not look any different. There was no smell of fire or smoke on him. What these three men had survived in the fire is symbolic of how the faithful remnant of Israel will survive someday in the fires of the Great Tribulation. Now, a parallel is, a parallel is made here with Isaiah 43, verse 2. And I'll just read that to you. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. 
and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. So much so, this is what we're seeing here with these three men. Now we see Nebuchadnezzar's response in verses 28 to 30. And the chapter now ends with his response to what has happened. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and have yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language that speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that is able to deliver after this sort. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar and his officers have just been presented with irrefutable proof that the God of Israel was superior to all other gods. The gods of the Babylonians could not ever, ever do this. They had witnessed a miracle. And in verses 28 to 29, the king issues a new decree in contrast to his earlier one about the worship of the golden image. The cause for it is in verse 28, and that is Nebuchadnezzar now recognizes the power of the God of these three Jews. He now realizes that his challenge back in chapter 3, verse 15, where he says, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Well, that challenge has now been accepted and answered. And by verse 28, he has learned who he is and what he is. So in light of his recognition of the power of the God of Daniel and his three friends, that he was able to send his angel to deliver the three Jews, he now issues this decree. It was not the Messiah in the furnace, but it was an angel who delivered them from it, just as it's going to be an angel that will deliver Daniel from the lion's den, which we're going to see in chapter 6. Concerning the three Jews, he says two things. First of all, they have changed the king's word. How? By their act of disobedience and their disregard for the decree to worship the golden image. Second, they yielded their bodies. This means they were willing to sacrifice themselves and become martyrs rather than serve any god but their own. He praised the three men for having faith in their God and also acknowledged their responsibility to worship no other deity but their own. And then in verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar now issued a new order. Therefore, I make a decree. In verse 29 are the words of the decree itself. The recipients of it are the peoples, the nations, and the languages. So these are all under the authority of Babylon. In other words, these are the very same ones who were called to worship the image. Now they all fall under a new decree which issues a prohibition. No one is to speak anything amiss against the God of these three Jews. No one is to make any negative comment against him. But notice here that Nebuchadnezzar does, does not affirm Jehovah as the one true God. He says some nice things about him, yet he still puts him among the other gods rather than acknowledge that he is the only God. Each of his statements in verse 29 falls short of true saving faith. So even with this incident, we cannot say that Nebuchadnezzar was a saved man. He also issues a penalty against anyone who would disobey this command and say something negative against the God of Israel. What's going to happen to them? Well, they'd be cut into pieces and their houses would become public outhouses. And the reason is, although there are other gods around, from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, yet none of them are capable of saving like this God who's able to do so. And that is his first response to issue a new decree. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now, his second response is to promote the three Jews in verse 30. And now, the word promoted here does not mean to be put into a higher office. 
They already had high office in the province of Babylon. Rather, the word means to cause, to prosper, and to increase in wealth. So he didn't give them a higher position, but he gave them some kind of financial raise in the positions they already had. They who were willing to lose all, including life itself, for the worship of the one true God, have now gained more than they ever thought to have. And that from this point forward, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are no longer mentioned in the book of Daniel. We're finished with them. It's all about Daniel from now on. Now, in conclusion here, there are four lessons to be drawn from this particular chapter. First lesson concerns those Jewish people who were living in Babylon as exiles. It was a warning to them of the evils of idolatry, that they should not bow down to idols, even if it meant forfeiting their lives. The second lesson is that during the times of the Gentiles, there'll be a temptation for Jews to assimilate into the Gentile culture and erase their Jewish distinctiveness. There certainly have been such temptations throughout Jewish history. But this chapter teaches the Jewish people the lesson that no matter how many years or centuries they may live among the Gentiles, they must never assimilate and lose their Jewishness. Rather, they must maintain it at all costs. And for that reason, American Jews, for instance, have for the most part remained distinct for the two centuries of that nation's history. And even we see that in Melbourne here in Victoria, there are distinct people living in a distinct area in the Melbourne Eruv. And they have remained distinct for even longer periods in many parts of the world. A third lesson then of this chapter is that during the times of the Gentiles, there will be those Jews who will reach prominent positions. But this will only cause jealousy and, increase in, and an increase in anti-Semitism. This has also been very true throughout Jewish history since their worldwide dispersion. Jews have attained high positions in Gentile society, in government, in economics, in the judiciary, and elsewhere. In fact, out of the total Gentile population, a disproportionate percentage of all Nobel Prize winners in various disciplines have been Jews. Wherever Jews do reach a prominent position, it causes jealousy and an increase in anti-Semitism. Fourth lesson is that regardless of the severity of the persecution, a remnant will always survive. No matter how bad the persecution gets, there will always be a believing Jewish remnant and a surviving Jewish remnant as well. This is true during the times of the Gentiles in general, but it's also true, going to be true during the Great Tribulation in particular, which Daniel will emphasize in the second half of his book. So this historical incident seems to have a prophetic significance as well. Because in the coming tribulation, a Gentile ruler, will, which we're going to see in chapter 7, verse 8, will demand for himself the worship that belongs to God. And any who refuses to acknowledge his right to receive worship will be killed. We're going to, we'll see that in Revelation 13, 15. So assuming political and religious power, he will oppress the saints. We're going to, we're going to, we'll see. Well, you can see that in Revelation 13, verse 7. So many of the people in the world will submit to and worship this world ruler, but a remnant like the three in Daniel's day will refuse. Many who will not worship the Antichrist will be severely punished. Some will be martyred for their faithfulness to Jesus Christ, but others will be delivered from those persecutions by the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. So there are the lessons. Now we see the, the dream of the great tree in chapter 4, verse 1 to 37. We see an introduction in the introduction there. We see the proclamation of the king in verses 1 to 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. It has seemed good unto me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. So here in verse 1, we have an ancient salutation. A letter is written from Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all peoples, nations and languages. Now these are the same 
groups of people that, that the two decrees of chapter 3 were directed towards. But now it's a greeting. It contains no new commands as such, but simply a greeting. Peace be multiplied unto you. And now in verse 2, he tells us the reason for the proclamation of chapter 4. It seemed good to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to relate some of the signs and wonders that the Most High God had wrought toward him. He had recently had a very unique experience that had lasted several years, and he wants to proclaim it. And in verse 3, he does issue a statement of praise to the Most High God of Israel. And he says four things. First, how great are his signs? Second, how mighty are his wonders? Third, in contrast to the Gentile kingdoms, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And fourth, whereas the Gentile empires succeed each other in turn, his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, this is almost a quote from Psalm 145, verse 13. Psalm 145, verse 13. Now, just a couple of observations here. Before we move on in, in his proclamation, there are three observations to note about these three verse, these first three verses here. First observation we see is in verse 3, and we're going to see it again in verse 37. There's a clear use of biblical terminology put into the mouth of a pagan Babylonian king. The kind of terminology a pagan like Nebuchadnezzar normally would know nothing about. So since the king himself was not knowledgeable in the Old Testament, this implies that it was Daniel who composed the final draft of this statement. Why? Because remember, Daniel was an official for the king. As is common today, for instance, you know, we have the prime minister. He'll make known certain things that he once said, and a speech writer will write it for him, put it together for him. On the same token, Nebuchadnezzar told Daniel certain things that he wished to get across, and then Daniel would have drafted the statements for him. And Daniel, uh, being knowledgeable in the Old Testament, included the biblical terminology of verses 3 and 37. Now, a second thing to note by way of observation goes back to chapter 3. That attitude of pride and defiance against the God of the, Jew, the, God of the Jews, which Nebuchadnezzar had displayed, which actually caused him to build the golden image in chapter 3, is going to be judged in chapter 4. That's the connection. A third observation is that there is a specific biblical motif or principle in his experience in chapter 4. We're going to look at that. The biblical background to this is in Job 33, verses 14 to 18. And we read in Job, Job 33, verse 14 to 18, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, though man regardeth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Now, what is being spoken about in, in, this, in, in the book of Job in these verses uh, is exactly what is happening in Daniel 4. In verse 14 of, of, of Job 33, God speaks once and then twice, and man still doesn't listen. So far in Daniel, God has spoken once to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 and the second time in chapter 3. But now in chapter 4, God is going to speak to Nebuchadnezzar for a third time. And in verse 15 of Job 33, we read that God speaks two times by dream and by vision, and that is the experience of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. In Job 33, 16, God's purpose is to instruct and to teach. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is to drive a lesson home to him. In the following verse, verse 17, it is specifically against human pride. That is exactly what it will be in Daniel 4. And then in verse 18, the purpose is to try to help him preserve his soul. It's the principle of verses 14 to 18 in the book of Job that is now illustrated in real life to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. It's a message to Nebuchadnezzar in which God gives him one last call for him to come to terms with the God of Israel and now become an Old Testament saint. Now, 
In Daniel chapter 4, verses 4 to 9, we again learn of the incompetence and failure of the wise men to meet the king's need. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told the dream before him, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no secret troubles you, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. So the proclamation proper begins in verses 4 to 5 as he spells out the circumstances which gave rise to the situation. In verse 4, it was at a time when all his conquests were now complete. He is now at rest in his house, and he's flourishing in his home palace. And after his period of conquest is over, including the conquest of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem, it is at this point that the dream comes. And in verse 5, it was a fearful dream. This is a, It was a second dream that God gave him since chapter 2. A dream which made me afraid, so that his thoughts troubled him while he was lying on his bed. It troubled him, and as the vision came, he was agitated. And the Aramaic word for troubled here means it was extreme terror or fright. That's how it troubled him. What he did in chapter 2, he does again in chapter 4. In verses 6 to 7, he calls all the wise men together. In verse 6 is the call. But this time he summons them by an official decree. This shows the seriousness with which he treated this dream. The purpose of the decree was to bring in all the wise men before him to make known unto me the interpretation. In chapter 2, he had wanted these wise men to tell him both the dream and the interpretation. This time, he doesn't make such an extreme demand of them. As he learned back in chapter 2, he could not do that. He'll tell them the dream this time, and he wants them to tell him the interpretation. In verse 7, they fail to do so again. Now, he does, he does tell them the dream, but they do not make known the interpretation. Now, it doesn't say in verse 7 they could not do it. All it says is they did not make known unto me the interpretation. This means one of two things. It may indicate that they could not do it, but it could also mean that they would not because they noticed the negative aspects of the dream and therefore were afraid to rouse the anger of this absolute monarch. So they refrained for one reason or the other. And in verses 8 to 9, this is Daniel, the head of the wise men and the head of the school of Babylonian astrology, who now enters. He comes in last. And Nebuchadnezzar points out that he has a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. Because among the Babylonians to whom this proclamation is being sent out, Daniel would be better known by his Babylonian name rather than his Hebrew name. But notice what else he says. He was thus named according to the name of my God. What he appears to be saying here is that Nebuchadnezzar still wants to give some credit to the Babylonian god named Bel, B-E-L. It was not his favorite god, but it was one of his chief gods. He wants to give some measure of credit to this Babylonian god by referring to Daniel, whose name is bel whom he had named after his own god. Also, he says that Daniel has the spirit of the holy gods. He uses the plural number again. He does not say Daniel has the spirit of the one true and only god, but that he has the spirit of the holy gods. He is still thinking polytheistically, and he still falls short of giving the God of Israel absolute and only deity. And in verse 9, he now addresses Daniel as he comes in, still using his Babylonian name. O Belteshazzar, 
thus trying to avoid any connection with the God of Israel with whom he has had two experiences so far. He calls him the master of the magicians because this title was not meant as a compliment. It was the appropriate address because that had been Daniel's position since chapter 2, verse 48, when he became the head of the Babylonian school of astrology. In practice, Daniel never performed astrology or any other form of divination. When Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that the, the Ruach Elohim condition, the spirit of the holy gods, was in Daniel, he simply addressed him as a master astrologer. From Nebuchadnezzar's perspective, he was simply the chief of the magicians, though that was not what he did by practice. He says, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So he still views Daniel simply as a master astrologer. Again, this still shows what he, that he fell short of true saving faith. Nothing is going to violate his polytheistic views. He still looks upon Daniel as the master of the magicians. He's still not willing to give full credence to the fact that Daniel's ability did not come by means of astrolo astrological uh, prognostications from the star charts, nor by means of practicing occult magic. Rather, his abilities came from the God of Israel. But Nebuchadnezzar does, does recognize further that no secret troubles you. And at the end of verse 9, he asks in a straightforward, kingly way, tell me the visions of my dream and the interpretation thereof. He does not ask Daniel to say what the dream itself was. But in verses 10 to 18, he relates what it was to Daniel. This is broken down into four parts. Thus were the visions, this is the great tree, thus were the visions of my head upon my, this is verses 10 to 12. Thus were the visions of my head upon my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much. And then it was food for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in the branches thereof, and all flesh was fed from it. So in verses 10 to 12, in the first part of his dream, he sees a great tree. And in verse 10, it stood in the midst of the earth, but its height was phenomenal, reaching toward heaven itself. The exact height is not given, but it's extremely high. And in verse 11, the development of this tree is given. It grew and became strong. The height of it was reaching up to heaven and the sight thereof was visible from any vantage point to the ends of the earth. And in verse 12, he tells us that it spread its influence everywhere. The leaves thereof were fair, which means they were beautiful. There was such an abundance of fruit in it, ensuring there was sufficient food for all. The land animals rested in its shade, and the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches. Then he says that all flesh was fed from it. It was an ideal picture. Now, after looking at a very beautiful and peaceful pastoral scene, in verses 13 to 16, everything is going to dramatically change. And we see the decree against the tree in verses 13 to 16, and we see the one responsible for the decree. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off its branches, shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from under it from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of its roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. So here in verses 13 to 16, it moves from a dream to a nightmare. Suddenly, in the midst of this very beautiful and tranquil scene, there is now a decree issued against this tree. In verse 13, he sees the one who is responsible for the decree it is an angelic being from heaven, a watcher and a holy one. Now, these are not two individuals, but rather 
simply two descriptive terms for one individual. Because Nebuchadnezzar keeps using the singular pronoun here. It's an angelic being, a watcher and the holy one who now comes down from heaven. And the Aramaic term for watcher, which is I-R, er, means waking or wakeful one. And it appears two other times in Daniel, namely in verse 17 and verse 23. That this individual was a heavenly being is assured by the second title Nebuchadnezzar gave him, Holy One. The king further declared that this figure came down from heaven. Clearly, this was an angelic being. He was a watcher. Why? Because he made sure that God's commands would be fulfilled. And he was holy because he was an angel and not a demon. And then in verse 14, this watching holy angel issues a command for the tree to be destroyed. It is to be hewn down. Its branches are also to be cut off and all the leaves shaken off. Its fruit is to be scattered everywhere. And all those animals resting underneath its shade are to be disturbed and chased away. The fowls from its branches must be driven away also. In essence, in verse 14, the tree is to be destroyed. But in verse 15, one thing is to be preserved. The stump of the tree with its roots is to be left in the tender grass of the field. Furthermore, after the tree has been cut down, the stump which remains must be banded with a band of iron and brass, which would help protect it. That means the stump would be preserved from the effects of the weather. So for some reason, the stump is now being preserved. Also in the end of verse 15 and the first part of verse 16, the angel spells out a judgment concerning the tree and the stump. Although it is bound for preservation, nevertheless, first of all, it will become wet with the dew of heaven. Second, his portion will be with the beast and the grass of the earth, meaning he's going to be eating grass. Third, let his heart be changed from a man's heart and let a beast's heart be given unto him. So these are the three elements of the judgments. And verse 16 ends by spelling out the duration of the judgment itself. Simply put, until seven times pass over him. The word times in the book of Daniel, which, we, which you see down in chapter 7, verse 25, chapter 7, verse 25, means years. For a period of seven years, this is the way it will be. Now, the Aramaic term for times uh, here appeared before, namely in chapter 2, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 8, and verse 9, and verse 21, 2, 8, 9, and 21, and also chapter 3, verse 5. In these verses, it maintained its normal meaning of time. But in verse 16, however, and all its subsequent instances, which we're going to see in chapter 4, 23, 25, 32, and chapter 7, verse 12, and twice in chapter 7, verse 25, term is used in reference to years. So the judgment would take seven years to now complete its course. And we see in verse 17 the purpose. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the lowest of men. So there is the purpose for this decree and the judgment. The source of it is the angelic court. This is the decree of the watchers and the demand of the holy ones up in heaven. The angelic assembly or court issued this decree by the word of the holy ones. And the intent of this judgment in verse 17 is that the living may know that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men. So God is referred to by many different names and titles. And here we find him addressed as the most high God. Now, according to Genesis 14, whenever God is addressed by the term the most high, it emphasizes that he is the possessor of the heavens and the earth. Genesis 14, 18 to 20 is a passage that clearly expresses this truth. This is Melchizedek. And Mel, this is chapter four, Genesis 14, 18 to 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of God most high. 
And he blessed him, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. So, therefore, as such a one, most high, possessor of heaven and earth, he has the right to give any portion of the earth to whomsoever he will. So anyone who rules over any territory of this earth does so only by a divine grant from God. Not only does he give it to whomever he will, he does set up over it the lowest of men. The lowest of men means the basest of men. Regardless of who wins elections to national government, it will be by divine decree because God does make the ultimate choice of who sits in the seats of power. Now we see the plea for interpretation in verse 18. So now, having related the dream, in verse 18, he pleads for the interpretation. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen, and you, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation. For as much as all, as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel that this is a dream in its entirety. The wise men were not able to give him the interpretation, but he knows that Daniel is able to do it. And how does he know that? For the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Again, he's still thinking polytheistically, like a pagan, because he uses the plural gods, and again, he again falls short of full faith. And this is where we're going to leave it for this session. Thank you for coming along. Study hard and grow strong.